Amen. Thank you, Brother Dalton, for singing this morning, helping lead songs as well. We have your Bibles open to the book of 2 Samuel, if you would. We're going to be in two different places this morning as we look, continue our series on the fabulous lessons from the first three kings. And we began last week to look at a time in David's life when he made some serious mistakes. There are times in our life when we'll make mistakes. And the, the point is not that we don't always make mistakes, but that we come back to God correctly. You know that God wants to make a message out of your mess. Let me repeat that one more time so you don't miss it. God wants to make a message out of your mess. We are accomplished at making messes. We're good at it. We think our children make messes, and they probably make minor messes in life, and maybe they'll spill things on the floor and get paint where it shouldn't go and crayons where it shouldn't be and food where it shouldn't be, but we make what we're accomplished at making a mess out of life. And God wants to take those message, messes and make, some, make a message out of them. And in the life of David and Saul, two different kings, we see some things that I believe will be a help to us today as we look at how God how God responds when we mess up. You see, in life, there is a temptation to not have a real apology, but to have, if I can this morning, a faux-pology. You say that with me? Have a faux-pology or a fake apology. One more, say that with me. Ready? A faux-pology. Have you ever heard of faux-pology? Oh, I bet you have. I bet you have, and we're going to look this morning, the Bible shows us one of these. Don't you love the fact that the Bible always gives us what we need for life? It explains to us, it demonstrates to us, but a faux apology, a fake apology. I mentioned last week that sometimes parents, we do this with our children. Tell your sister you're sorry, and then you'll be okay. I'm sorry, or you're sorry, right? Right? What does I'm sorry even mean? Well, in our culture, we've determined that if we say I'm sorry, then everything's done. You know, in the Bible, that's not repentance. We're going to look at that this week and next week, what the Bible talks about. But a, but a faux apology. Maybe you've heard these things when someone says it like this, well, I'm sorry, but. I'm sorry, but. In a sense, we're saying, listen, I'm sorry, But you have to understand here what happened. I couldn't help myself. They punched me first. So I necessarily must have punched them back. A while ago, there's two children having a little argument. And the one child said something. Not in my house, all right? Not in my house. It's a different situation. One child said something. So naturally, the other child kicked them. Why did you kick them? Because they said that. I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have said that, right? That's how people apologize. Is that a real fo- apology or is that a faux apology? Help me here. What is that? Faux apology. It's a faux apology. I'm sorry if. I'm sorry if. I'm sorry if you were offended when I slapped you. Don't you love when people start conversations like this? Now, don't get offended. Always followed by the most offensive thing you've heard all day. And if you respond to any offense, oh, that's not my fault. I'm sorry, but I told you not to get offended. (laughs) Right? A faux apology. I'm sorry if. Or or how about this? I'm, I'm sorry for everything I've ever done. Just a blanket all faux apology. No accountability. Just a blanket like, listen, in the whole life, in the whole scheme of 30, 40, 60 years, I'm sorry. Do you know that people now want confession without cleansing? In fact, there's an app on the App Store, Confession. I've seen this illustration. I looked it up to see if it's still there. It's still there. Don't look now, please. You can go on this app. You can apparently input your sin, get the category of your sin, and then find out how to confess that, what you have to do for that all from the sanctity of your own home or automobile or wherever you're at, full confession. This morning, the Lord's help, I'm going to look at what a genuine 
biblical response is supposed to be and what it's not supposed to be. Now, my point this morning and this week and next week, most likely, is not so that your earthly relationships are now solved, though I think they will be helped by these biblical principles. They'll be helped if in life we learn how to apologize and to confess for real, not faux apologies. There'll be some help in, in, in moms and dads and sons and daughters and friends and coworkers if you apply these biblical principles. But that's not my main concern this morning. My main concern this morning is that when we approach God, we repent correctly. I'm a whole lot more concerned about this relationship than this relationship, though I'm concerned about this one. But many people are more concerned about this than this. Let's look in Scripture at a couple of different passages. I want you to see what God has said and what happens here. If you have your Bibles and open to 2 Samuel, if you're in 2 Samuel, if you look in the, in the 11th chapter to begin with, in the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel, we have the account of David and his sin with Bathsheba. We have David and he, and he has been a compromising situation now. He's done the cover-up. And in verse 27, when the morning was passed, David sent and fetched her to his house. She became his wife, the bear my son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. We ended this last week, that God sees what we do. God sees our actions. And the Bible says, though nothing on the outside had happened yet, God had made an observation. God narrated this account, and he said, I'm not happy with this situation. I'm not pleased, even though he had not done something yet. Sometimes we mistake God's patience for apathy. We think because God hasn't acted yet, he doesn't care. But my friend, God absolutely cares. I want you to hold your finger there in 1 Samuel chapter 11. And if you would, please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we have the first king of Israel. His name was King Saul. Weeks ago, we looked at some of the things about King Saul. He was very tall. Tall Saul. Head and shoulders above everyone else in the country. He was a tall man. He began as a humble man. In fact, when they wanted to crown him to be king, they couldn't find him because he was hiding in the luggage. I remember years ago, my daughter, we played hide and seek, and my daughter climbed into like an ottoman in front of the couch, a square thing like this, and folded herself up into this thing. I could fold myself up into it too, once. And then the jaws, the jaws would have to get me out of that thing, all right? But she's folded. Well, Saul wasn't folded up in the luggage. He was too tall. He was hiding, though. He was humble. But here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul has made a mistake. Saul's made a mistake, and he has not fully obeyed the Lord. He's mostly obeyed him. He's obeyed him about maybe 85 or 87, pick a number. He's mostly obeyed him, 89.5%. Because 63% of all statistics are made up on the spot. I'll let that sink in for you. He's mostly obeyed the Lord here. In this time, we're going to see what God's response is to King Saul. Let's pray and ask God's help. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you direct our hearts, our minds, and our thoughts in the next few moments. Lord, I need your help. I want to give the truth from your word in a way that's clear and succinct, but Lord, I pray that you touch us this morning. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be challenged by your word. Lord, I pray that if there's areas in our life that we've not responded to you correctly, Lord, I pray that today you would help us to change and be like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, bless this time. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We have in these chapters, 1 Samuel 15, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, two determined kings. We have two kings who are, who are different. There's Saul and David. Saul, the first king, David, the second king. Saul uh, was anointed and then hid, and, and David anointed while Saul was king, and David had to hide from Saul. Both of these men had seen victory, Saul over the Philistines and David over the Goliath and over the Philistines. Two determined kings, both had lived a little while now as kings. They were neither at this stage of their life, neither of them were new kings. Both had shown victories and both had shown stubbornness. 
Stubbornness is not always a bad thing, and they show some stubbornness inside of, of serving the Lord, but now they come to a, li- a point in their life, both their lives of these two determined kings where they made two disastrous mistakes. In 1 Samuel chapter number 15 and 16, um, we have a situation with Saul. And God came to Saul and said, Saul, you're supposed to go kill the Amalekites, and Saul did it. He took care of most of the problem. But he kept some of the best alive. And Samuel the prophet came to him and said, Saul, what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep? Saul, why do I hear these sheep going? Or why do I hear the and, and Saul responds in a way that will help us this morning. But I want you to notice, if you would, in verse number 26 of 1 Samuel 15. Well, the Bible says, I will not return with thee, same as in us all, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Now, if you would, hold your finger there as so we jump a little bit. Jump back to 2 Samuel, could you please? Hold your finger in 1 Samuel. And in 2 Samuel, if you look in chapter 12, Verse number 13. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, where the Bible says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. I want to explain a couple things. I want to jump into this. We'll, look, we'll go back to 1 Samuel. There are these two determined kings... And there are these two disastrous mistakes. Saul did most of what God said. And God said, Saul, I've rejected you from being king. David, he lied, he deceived, he stole, committed adultery, murder, cover up. And God said to him, the Lord hath put this away from you, thou shalt not die. So you look at these two responses from God, in my earthly mind, they don't make sense. Now, do they? Between the two, I think what David did was a whole lot worse than what Saul did. Right? God said to Saul, go to this other country. Saul went. All right? Have a victory over this people. Saul had the victory. God said, destroy everything about over here, and Saul did most of it. Got it almost all the way done. If it were a lawn, Saul cut everything but a small patch, a 10 by 10 foot patch of a two acre lot. If he was painting the auditorium, all he forgot was maybe this wall over here. Everything else would be painted. Are you understanding this? As I'm looking at this, I say, well, you know what, Saul, you almost... Did everything. You're real close. And then I look at David. I think, David, you dirty rat, right? David, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. And God said, Saul, David, I see what you did. And Saul, you're rejected. And David, I'm going to put this away from you. We have to ask ourselves a few questions. And well, one, is God playing favorites? Now, some people say, oh, yeah, God, of course, plays favorites. He likes some people more than other people. And it's usually when someone says that, they're thinking about someone else, not themselves. He obviously likes them because he gave them a new car, didn't give me a new car. God plays favorites. Well, God doesn't play favorites in that sense. God in this situation did not say, oh, you know what, David? I flipped my holy coin. Heads, Saul, you're done. Tails, David, you win. It's not what God did, is it? No, there had to be something else going on here because we have two determined kings, two disastrous mistakes, and two totally different responses from God. I would submit this morning, we're going to look at this morning, that the difference in response from God was not based on the gravity of their sin, but the genuineness of their repentance. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not, put it in the front of your Bible because you're going to mess up in your life. You're going to mess up. You're going to make some mistakes in your life. And the devil's going to come in. He's going to say, listen, you're nothing but a deadbeat. You're nothing but a loser. And he's right. Right? Are we not? 
except we're saved as Christians. And he called us to be his sons and daughters. And the difference in the response from God is not in the gravity of the sin, but in the genuineness of the repentance. You see, Saul had a faux apology. Saul had a faux apology. And we'll look at this morning, if we can, back in 1 Samuel chapter 15. All the things that Saul said, and I love it, it's the same things we say today. The same things. Look, back in 1 Samuel chapter 15, let's look this morning at the response of Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul has done partially what God has said. He didn't have complete obedience. Samuel the prophet comes in verse number 13 and begin to confront him. And as Samuel walks up to confront Saul, look in verse number 13. We're going to see denial. The first step in understanding if you don't have the repentance is if you're still denying your mistakes. Now look there in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him. You see this? This is what he says. Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Before Samuel can say a single thing, Saul says, yep, I did it. I did everything right, denying. I would submit that Saul knew what was going on here. He, he began to deny, nope, yep, 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 I'm it. Nope, I didn't, I, I didn't mess up. No, no, I did everything I was supposed to do. There was nothing that I was supposed to do that I didn't do. Nothing was left undone because I am Saul and I have done everything. Denial. He started off by saying, listen, I have obeyed. I have obeyed. But we know that he hadn't obeyed. He hadn't obeyed. He'd done the opposite. He'd not obeyed, right? Disobedience. I didn't make a mistake. I obeyed. I didn't mess up. I didn't mess up. I did it perfectly. So, Samuel, why are you here? He starts off before Samuel can say anything. He says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, this is wonderful, Samuel. It's so great to see the prophet. I'm glad you're here, prophet, because I have obeyed. I nailed it. Samuel, I crushed it. Yeah, good thing I'm on the Lord's side because I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Boy, he's lucky to have me on his team because I did it. That's right. Except he hadn't. Except he hadn't. And I'd submit, he knew it. You know why I submit that? Because we know it. We know it. We know when we blow things, right? We know when we mess up. And Saul came out of the gate in flat out denial. Nope. I'm glad you're here, prophet, because you and me were on the same team. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Listen, the name of the Lord. Listen, Samuel, we're on this together. You obey God, I obey God. Look at that. You and me, we're like teammates. Except we're not. Except we're not. Listen, in our own life, we do this to the Lord. Lord, I've done this. Lord, I've trusted you. Why did you let me down? I've obeyed everything you've asked me to do. Think about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus Christ. And he asked how to have eternal life, how to get to heaven. And and Jesus asked about the commandments. And the rich young ruler said that he'd kept every commandment since his youth up. Well, that's impressive. Jesus, you and me, were on the same team. You do everything God says, I do everything God says. Listen, my friend, the first step if we're going to have a full apology is not, in not admitting when we're wrong. Not admitting when we're wrong. Help me here. Can you help me here and say something? I'm wrong. You say that with me? No, no, not you're wrong like at me. Okay. I'm wrong plenty of times. Just ask my wife. She'll give you all the stories, or some of them at least. Can we say, I'm wrong? Say that with me, please. I'm wrong. One more time, like you actually can sincerely, like, I'm wrong. Look at the person next to you. Person next to you, tell them you're wrong. No, t- no, no, tell them they're wrong, absolutely. 
Because the second step is this. In a full apology, blame shifting. Blame shifting. Let's look at what Saul did here to blame shift. This, we do this in life too, but let's look at what Saul did here. It's just so intriguing to me. Samuel comes to Saul and says, I performed the command of the Lord, verse 14. And Samuel says, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Can I just pause here real quick? Because this verse makes me chuckle. This verse makes me laugh. This is an absolute parenting verse. As your child sits there with chocolate chip crumbs all over their face and their hands, all right, all messed up with cookie crumbs, and you say, did you eat the cookie? And they're like, mm-mm, mm-mm, not me. Well, what meaneth the crumbs on your hands and on your face, right? This is what Samuel has done. Saul's like, I obey. You and me, same team. And Samuel says, well, what, then why do I hear some sheep and some cows, Saul? This is what Saul says. Verse number 15. And Saul said, what's the next word? They. They. Saul said what? They. They did it. <laughs> we're on the same team, Samuel. It wasn't me. But you and me, man, we're the only ones out here doing this. They, all those people out there, man, it's a terrible people. They wouldn't let me obey God. I'm trying here. They did it. Blame shifting. We would never blame shift in life, would we? Well, Lord, I'd have a good attitude. I really would for you if they treated me right. Blame shifting. Lord, I'd, I'd have faith. I'd walk by faith in my life if they did. Lord, I'd go to church. I really would if they hadn't mistreated me there. If that pastor wasn't so mean. If they sang the song I wanted. If they'd not painted the wood. Listen, people leave church for less. You and I both know this, don't they? They, blame shifting. Wives and husbands. Well, I'd forgive them if they hadn't. Right? What does Saul do? He blame shifts. Just like that. Genuine repentance does not involve blame shifting. This is not new with King Saul. We saw it in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And when God confronts Adam and Eve, they point. Remember? God goes to Eve. Eve goes serpent. God goes to Adam. Adam goes Eve. God. Her fault. And really, the woman thou gavest me, God. So really, God, if you had changed the situation, boy, I'd, be, I'd still be on your team, but boy, you just messed me up. It's hard to play against you, God. What, what are you doing to me? Blame shift. We get in trouble, we mess up. People tend, we tend, I tend, we tend to want to blame. Our flesh wants to blame everybody else except the real culprit. Who's a real culprit? Help me here. Can you use your thumbs like I am? Help me. Right here. Who's the real culprit? All right, let's try it again. Thanks, Pastor Treadway. Point right at me. I like that. <laughs> let's try this again. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Who's the real culprit? Me. But Saul's not done yet. God's so gracious. He comes to us and he works with us in situations because we often respond the same way when God convicts us and corrects us. We deny, we blame shift. Saul doubles down. Look in verse number 20. Samuel has said, listen, Saul, why don't you obey the voice of the Lord? And verse number 20, Saul says, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He says it again, I've done this. I've not messed up. He's still denying. And I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil. And what happened here is Saul now had not only blame shifted, you ready for this? He doubled down on it. He locked in his heels. 
He started all over again because if he gets a little bit louder, a little more determined, a little more obstinate, maybe now the situation will change. Well, Samuel, you didn't quite hear me the first time. Remember, Samuel, I have obeyed the Lord. Remember, Samuel, we're still on the same team. I didn't mess up. Remember, it wasn't me. He doubles down on it. That's not repentant, is it now? No way. He doubles down. He blame shifts. Continues on because another aspect of a full apology. He's been confronted. And Samuel has brought some points to him. Look in verse number 24. Verse number 24, where Saul said to Samuel, Finally, I have sinned. You wonder what brought him to this point. Verse number 23, Samuel has now brought some incredible truth to Saul. And he said, listen, Saul, rebellion, not doing what God said, is as a sin of witchcraft. Not obeying God is so anti-God that you're aligning yourself with demonic forces when you don't obey God. I preached a message on that, what it looks like to be against God in that way. I don't want to re-preach that. But just remember that Samuel has now said, listen, this is a big deal to God. And finally, it seems as if Saul gets it. Finally, it seems like it, finally, Saul's like, it's, it's, at first you would think the light has turned on, that we've gotten somewhere, that now he's listened to him. And we look here at verse 24, and he goes, I have sinned, for I have transgressed of the commandment of the Lord and thy words. Now, don't look anywhere else in that verse yet. If he had stopped right there, if he had stopped right there, this would have been excellent. If you stop right there, listen, I have sinned, I have transgressed. When you go to repent to God or to your fellow man, I've messed up. I've blown it. And stop. Or shut it. Saul didn't. What does he say? I've sinned, I've transgressed. He says, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You see, Saul denied he blame shifted, he doubled down, and here it is, he self-justified. He self-justified. Well, Saul, you have to understand, yes, I blew it. Oh, I'm so sorry, but here's the situation. Let me give it to you straight. I couldn't obey God because the people, I was afraid of them. Look at them, they're so scary. I feared the people. Well, Samuel, they would have done bad things to me. I couldn't obey. I was afraid. With the intended response being, oh, I'm sorry you're afraid. My bad. I didn't realize you were afraid of the people. Well, don't worry about obeying God then. It's no big deal. If you're afraid, well, all is forgiven then. Don't worry. Perfectly acceptable excuse. No, of course not. Listen, we do the same thing. God, I would have, but I was fearful. God, I couldn't give a track. I couldn't give a track. Why not? Because what would they say to me? I was afraid. And we believe that then God just overlooks our mistakes because we were afraid. Now we've self-justified. God, I couldn't give. Why couldn't you give? Well, because I wasn't sure how it all worked out. I was afraid. Oh, you were afraid. No problem. All is forgiven. Of course not. You see, the Bible brings to us what we do right now in 2021. Lord, I couldn't do that. I was afraid. You've been through fearful times. People denying God's goodness and help because of fear. And Saul says, listen, I'm not that guilty. I was just afraid. Self-justification. But one more step. Up until this point, God, I think, has been trying to Get to Saul. Verse 25, Saul says this. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Last thing Saul said was this. Listen, let's just make this go away. 
I don't want to really deal with this thing. I don't want to deal with this problem. I don't want to deal with the situation. So listen, Samuel, let's just, okay, you and me, we're, we're all good. All right, you pardon my sin, forgive me, and then we'll go worship God. And honor me, he says later on, honor me in front of all the people. He wants to preserve a self-image. See, here's a, here's a problem, friend, friends. The problem is that often we approach God the same way as Saul did. We say, God, it's not my fault. What I'm doing is not really that bad. I have done what you've asked me to do. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. We're confronted with our sin, confronted with the mistake, and then we go further and say, listen, well, uh, it's not my fault. If someone else had been different, if the situation had been different, if life had been different, if you give me different parents, put me in a different situation, give me different finances, put me in a different church, whatever it may be, we shift the blame and say, well, that's why I messed up. With further truth and confrontation, we double down. And then we want to just push it aside and self-justify. I was just afraid it's small. And then we say, well, okay, God, fine. Push it all the way. We're done. Let's continue on. And that's not what God is looking for. The difference in the response between Saul and David was not the, the gravity of their sin, but the genuineness of their repentance. You see, David, we'll look at next week in Psalm 51. David's confronted a year later. When David's confronted in Psalm 51, David says things like this, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Pardon my iniquities, perverseness. Remove my transgressions, rebellion. Remember Saul? Was it my fault? David, it's all my fault. David says, listen, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Lord, just make sure you and I are right. Saul, hey, restore unto me that we're good. We'll go back out there and worship together. Preserve my self-image. Saul saying, let's make this go away. And David says this later on in life, my sin is ever before me. Genuine repentance. You see, it's two kings. Two mistakes. Two responses from God. In our life, I don't want you to be in the spot where God says, listen, I'm done. I'm done. Because remember Saul and David, if it was up to me, I think what David is a whole lot worse than what Saul did. But with one, God said, I'm done with you. The other one, God said, listen, I can work with this. And I want God to work with me through my mistakes. I want to have genuine repentance. When you mess up, fess up. Not by blame shifting, denial, doubling down, self-justification or self-preservation. But say, God, it's you. I've blown it. In your life, God will touch us. He'll touch us through our Bible reading, through church, through friends, through his word. And you'll be tempted, I'll be tempted, to say, God, it's not my fault. God, it's not as big a deal as you want to make it to be. It's a little deal. God, I'm still on your team. It's you and me, buddy. Everyone else is against us. And God says, no, deal with this. My friend this morning deal with it. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to come to you in repentance and confession. Lord, I think of Saul and Lord, it appeared at first that it was just a, it appeared to be maybe a minor mistake, but Lord, in your eyes, it was a grave mistake. But Lord, then his spirit was such that he couldn't deal with the issue. Lord, I pray you'd help us to deal with the issues as you show us those things. Lord, in our life, we're going to make mistakes. Lord, we must respond correctly to you. I wonder if you here this morning and say, Pastor, as, as you spoke, God spoke to me. I want to make sure I respond the right way. Pastor, if I'm honest, I, I probably tend to maybe blame shift, deny self-preservation self-justification pastor as you spoke God spoke to me I want to make sure that I respond the right way I don't want to end up like Saul I'd be like David 
Why don't we say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up? Sit back down. God bless you. One of you here this morning, you say, Pastor, I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I'm not sure if I died today I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. I'll draw no more attention to you than did anyone else. But if you're here this morning you're, and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to pray for you this morning. You go, but the Bible will show you about that. One who would say that, that's me, Pastor. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? met with us this morning. Lord, you've touched many hearts. Lord, I pray that your word would be effective. Lord, those who want to make sure they respond the right way, Lord, would you give them the grace and strength to do that? Lord, guide this invitation. May we keep our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. As you